And so after independence and when the Constitution was being drafted, many Americans insisted not simply on a Bill of Rights in general, but specifically on a provision that would make clear that the federal government possesses only those powers that have been expressly delegated to it. It's not an unlimited national legislature. It is a federal legislature uh, with limited powers. And so we got what became the Tenth Amendment. And the Tenth Amendment, of course, says that the federal government possesses all those powers that the states have not delegated, uh, uh, that the states have delegated to it, but only those powers. The states retain for themselves all powers not delegated to the federal government. Uh, the states or the people retain the powers in question. And Thomas Jefferson said this is the cornerstone of the whole Constitution. It keeps the federal government limited. And yet, if you were to take the bar exam today, let's say, and you're, you're going to one of these cram courses to prepare for the bar exam at the last minute, and they're giving you test-taking tips about the multiple choice section, my co-author, Kevin Gutzman, who is both a, a history PhD and a JD, tells me that at those sessions, they tell you that if one of the multiple choice answers is the Tenth Amendment, you know that's wrong. That's never right. So you can automatically just cross that out. <laughs> now, this is the cornerstone of the Constitution, and it's just out. According to our legal establishment, it's not even, it's not even there anymore. Well, so that's just ha well, how did, you know How did this happen? Well, this is, again, this is a limitation of Constitution. There's no way to stop this. There is no way to stop this. The Constitution does not grow fangs and attack you if you violate it. There's no way to stop this from happening. There's the fact that in the 1990s, Bill Clinton's Solicitor General, and I, I feel bad attacking Bill Clinton these days, you know what I mean? What a paradise we had by comparison. <laughs> but anyway, you know, they're all the same crummy bunch, so it's not too bad. I'm not going to weep too much about attacking him. But in the 1990s, Bill Clinton's Solicitor General was asked, can you name just one area of American life that, in your view, the Constitution absolutely forbids the federal government to involve itself in, and the guy just stood there stupefied that the question had been asked. Of course, he had no answer. There is no answer, no answer whatsoever. There is a, a, supposed to be an interpretive difference in how the federal government and the states are treated in the Constitution. What I mean by that is the other day I got an email from somebody asking, uh, he had been reading Ron Paul's book and said, now, Ron Paul seems to suggest that the federal government is prohibited from issuing so-called bills of credit which more or less actually correspond to what we would understand as fiat money. And he said, but I looked at the Constitution, and it doesn't prohibit the federal government from issuing bills of credit. It prohibits the states from doing so. So do you think that this is a, 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 a flaw in the Constitution? And I said, actually, no, it isn't, because in the Constitution, yes, the states are prohibited from doing certain things. But the understanding is the federal government has only those powers the states delegate to it. So the federal government only has a power if it is expressly stated. If it's not expressly stated, then the states retain that power. So the mere fact that the federal government is not authorized to emit bills of credit itself suffices to prohibit it from doing so. But has it prohibited it from doing so? I mean, uh, so. The questions answer themselves. By the late 1930s, we got this beauty. We got the Caroline Products decision which contains in it footnote number four. And in case you're thinking, my gosh, this guy's some kind of freaking genius. He knows a footnote from a Supreme Court case. But footnote four of the Caroline Products case is so well known, it's simply referred to as footnote four. Footnote four says that everything the federal government does is presumed to be constitutional. <laughs> which seems like an awful lot of weight for one footnote to bear, right? <laughs> and I'll get back to that in a minute, because it does, it does then later go on to say, well, you know, okay, you could find something unconstitutional, but here are the hoops you have to jump through to prove that. I'll get back to that in a minute. But it just goes to show that all these attempts to limit the power of government have just been effortlessly brushed aside. Now, Jefferson thought, ultimately, that it was the people whose responsibility it is to uphold the Constitution. But, you know, I read not long ago a headline that said, over half of Americans are on the dole in one form or another. Over half of Americans are get, getting some kind of goodies 
So if you say to them, hey, we need, to, we need to have a limited government, you know, under the Constitution, they'll just say, you know, take a hike, pal. I want my, my loot. So even the people become corrupted. So who's going to enforce the thing? It seems like it just can't be done. So one thing that we, one of the points we focus on and that I focus on in some of my writing is uh, the hilarious jurisprudence of the Commerce Clause. Now, there's a clause in the Constitution about regulating interstate commerce, commerce going from one state to another. Now, James Madison said that this clause is not really intended to give the federal government a positive power. It's really a negative power. That is, the, it, it, it empowers the federal government to strike things down that inhibit the freedom of commerce, barriers to commerce, obstacles, for example, tariffs that one state might erect against other states' products, that sort of thing. But by the early 19th century, with the evil John Marshall, uh, John Marshall is Chief Justice of the United States from 1801 to 1835, who is falsely held up as a hero by many libertarians. He's a scoundrel. He's a disgusting human being who should be respected by nobody. But that's a whole other matter. We'll talk about that later. But John Marshall began to argue that, no, 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 actually the Commerce Clause is far more expansive than we dreamed. That, in fact, the Commerce Clause can authorize the federal government to regulate anything that takes place in a state that might have an effect on another state. Well, you know, as Jefferson said, look, in, in some fundamental, you know, looking at, at things, you know, sub specie eternitatis, everything affects everything else. So this, in effect, is giving us an unlimited government. And that's, in fact, what's happened. Now, in the 20th century, that was changed so that now it has to have a substantial effect on another state, and then they can regulate it. But... Well, take, for example, this is my favorite example. Many of you have probably heard of this case. In 1942, we got this Wickard versus Filburn Supreme Court case involving a farmer who had grown wheat for his own use to consume or to feed to his livestock on his own farm. And the federal government was trying to regulate how much he was allowed to grow. And he said, well, you know, forget that. How can you regulate that? I mean, this is not interstate commerce. I mean, it's not even moving... It's not even inter-property commerce. It's right here on my <laughs> land. How could you possibly regulate it? I'm, I'm growing it. I'm consuming it. And the answer was that because you're growing your own wheat, that means you're not purchasing wheat in the interstate market. So by abstaining from purchasing wheat in the interstate market, you are implicitly engaged in interstate commerce and thereby subject to regulation. <laughs> So there goes Madison's, oh, this don't worry about this clause, doesn't really mean much, you know, don't anybody worry. So this, after that, after early 1940s, for the next half century, the Supreme Court did not once challenge the other branches of the federal government on their interpretations of the Commerce Clause. Not one time. They let the federal government get away with all kinds of crazy things on the ground that interstate commerce somehow authorized it. Well, that stopped in 1995. We got this Lopez, U.S. versus Lopez case. In that case, that involved a, a law involving gun-free school zones. Now, there were already 40 states that had gun-free school zone laws, so this seemed to have been pretty well in hand, but the federal government was arguing that it had the right to go and regulate guns in and around schools, and it doesn't matter if you think that's a good idea or not. The point is, is it authorized by the Constitution to, to do this, which would seem to be a state matter. The argument they used, though, to justify it was based on the Commerce Clause. And it went as follows, that if students are afraid that there might be guns in or around their schools, they won't be able to learn as effectively. And if they don't learn as effectively, they're going to wind up ignorant. And if they're ignorant, they won't be as productive, and therefore not as many goods will be produced, and therefore interstate commerce will be lessened. <laughs> and so... The Supreme Court, which is normally pretty indulgent on these things, said that that's a bit much even for us and <laughs> struck that down. But a lot of people looked at this and a lot of people who still sort of cling to the idea that we can limit government, they said, aha, finally, 53 years later, the Supreme Court sees the light. But in fact, if you look closely at the case, they don't actually question the substantial effects doctrine. Their argument was that does not substantially affect interstate commerce. But they still kept that rule that if it does, then we can, then we can regulate it. So people started to think this is a new birth of limited government. It was no such thing. Ten years later, and, and, this, and I don't need to just take a case from ten years later, but this is a, a well-known case. 
There was the medical marijuana case involving uh, Angel Rach. Now, uh, again, a lot of times when you talk about medical marijuana with libertarians, they're argue they get impatient with this and they say, this is such a small issue. You know, why don't we focus more on generally, you know, general legalization questions? But I focus on this because the legal arguments here are so revealing about the nature of the U.S. government that I cannot uh, restrain myself from examining it. In the Rage case, you have a woman, actually, initially it was two women. Um, this is a case that made its way through two lower courts and then to the Supreme Court. In the two lower courts, it actually involved a, a couple of women, and then ultimately it only involved Angel Rage. But these were women who had one condition or another that could be alleviated only by the medicinal use of cannabis. And she and Angel Rach, you know, grew her own plant or, or had people grow plants and then give, give the stuff to her or um, Diane Monson grew them herself and whatever. And California had a special law, uh, the Compassionate Use Act of 1996, that authorized this in cases like this.